Good evening, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to this evening's uh, webinar uh, from the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. My name is Sinead McCool, and I'll be, um, I suppose, hosting or chairing the event this evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, some people might be taking uh, escaping exams in their house or coming in out of all this lovely sunshine, but thanks for coming along tonight and a lovely evening. Um, tonight, we have Yoni Clark. And she is going to give us um, another update on uh, where we're at with the falsified medicines directive in Ireland. And um, I suppose she was there, she was with us this time last year um, as we moved from the use and learn phase into the full launch, I suppose. And she's back, I suppose, to give us uh, another update on, on what this year has brought us. So we have some domestics before we go. You might have seen a little note at the start to say the webinar will be recorded because as you know, it comes up on the website for people who maybe couldn't make it tonight. Um, everybody's microphones are muted. Um, as is, people will know this probably already, that um, if you're having connectivity, uh, we're happy for you to switch off the video, but equally you can leave it on or switch it off, whichever is your preference. Um, and we would say if there's an issue with sound, um, just check your, I suppose, your uh, computer itself to see that there isn't an issue with the speakers on your uh, computer or phone. Or we would say just leave the meeting and then click on the link again, because sometimes at the start, if there's a rush in the door, so to speak, and um, things can go awry slightly there. Um, we're happy to hear from you. Um, and I suppose those who have come along a number of times would know um, if you move, move your kind of cursor, there's a little uh, chat box in the kind of middle of your screen. If you click on that, you can put in questions. And the format is the, of the evening is, um, Leonie will give about a 45 minute presentation. As you think of something, please feel free to put the questions in. We'll kind of um, have a review those and then put them to Leone. There may be themes that emerge so we can cover a few things in one or two questions. We're more than happy to hear from you. And at the end, um, we have a little survey that'll appear in the chat box and, and any feedback or suggestions are always welcome. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Leonie Clark, um, somebody I knew in, in a former life, but currently she's the Chief Executive of um, the Irish Medicines um, Verification Organisation, which I suppose is leading on the FMV uh, Directive in Ireland. So over to you, Leonie. Thanks very much, Sinead. Um, I will just share my screen here now, just give me a moment. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep, yep. Okay, great. Okay, first of all, everyone, thanks very much for coming along to the webinar this evening. I actually went out for a walk myself just before it, and I could see the temptation to keep walking and not come back in, just given that the weather has improved. But so thanks to those who did actually come back in and uh, join us this evening. So um, just to go through what I am going to do today, let me just see can I get my slide to move on and move down in a test. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to run through a few um, of the following themes today. I'm just going to give a quick recap of what FMD means, a little bit about roles and responsibilities. Where are we now, given that the theme is where are we now a year after the use and learn period ended? A little bit about alert management, some miscellaneous topics, a little bit of information about the support that IMVO provides, um, and then there'll be a QA, Q and a session. And then I've also provided a bit more information and some backup slides if anyone's interested in reading some more. So without further ado, I'll go into the recap of FMD. So obviously FMD means falsified medicines directive. So this directive has been around for a long time. And you know, I, I found it quite interesting in the last year or two when people were saying we should lobby to get rid of all of this. Because in reality, the decision to do all of this was made many, many years ago. So the directive was enacted in 2011, but the concept would have been floating around for five or six years before that. And what this directive did was it introduced several measures to tackle the growing threat of falsified medicines and ensure the trade in medicines is rigorously controlled. And these included um, the inclusion of safety features on the outer packaging of medicines. So as you know, that means the little 2D barcode on the anti-tamper device. Secondly, then we had an EU-wide logo to identify legal online pharmacies and medicines retailers. And that's the little logo you see in the bottom of the screen there. So if you're selling medicines online, you must be registered in your member state and you must have that website on or logo on your website and it generally clicks through to whoever operates the register in that member state. And here in Ireland, it's the PSI that contains the register. And those of you who work in pharma, I see with some industry colleagues at Satan will be aware that tougher controls, a rules on the controls and inspections produces of APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients were introduced. And finally, there were additional requirements for wholesalers, including extra record keeping. So things like a batch tracking into pharmacy level that was required. 
What we had then was a 2011 directive that required, particularly in the safety features, from the establishment of a medicines verification system to support the scanning of those packs and actually checking that the information was correct. And the detail of how that was to be done was set out in what was called the Commission Delegated Regulation in 2016. So it took about five years to work out the details. And what this aim does is it sets out more details about safety features, primarily focused on the barcode. It says very little about the anti-tamper device. And it spelled out the legal obligations of national medicines verification organizations, including ourselves, manufacturers, wholesalers, pharmacies, and hospitals. So all the law on this basically comes from the falsified medicines directive and that delegated regulation or DR that you see um, mentioned there. There are some implementing um, statutory instruments here in Ireland, but the detail is contained and defined at European level. So every pharmacy, hospital, wholesale, manufacturer across Europe is bound by the same requirements that apply here in Ireland. So I suppose coming back to the question of why was the falsified medicines directive necessary? So we, we've all been aware for many years that there's a significant problem with illegal medicines worldwide and online sales and um, various um, basically in the illegitimate supply chains, highly unregulated, highly suspect, large numbers of counterfeit and fake medicines. WHO, for example, it would estimate that 10% of medicines in low and middle income countries were substandard or falsified. The HPRA continues to, uh, to detain large numbers of falsified and other illegal medicines being brought online and brought in through ports illegally. And as I say, 1 million in dosage units in 2022. So these are in the illegal supply chain. There's very little hard data on the number of falsified medicines in the legitimate of the legal supply chains. When we talk about that, we mean manufacturers to wholesalers to pharmacies to hospitals. You know, the supply chain we're all familiar with in that operates every day here in Ireland and across Europe. There was, however, the realization if the problem was so big in the illegal supply chain, but reality that was going to happen was these falsified medicines were going to start finding their way into the legal supply chain. And it was decided to take action to strengthen and also to harmonize the controls to prevent the introduction of falsified medicines. So this measure is very much a preventive measure. It's not there to fix the problem in the supply chain. It's there to protect the supply chain and prevent large numbers of falsified medicines coming in. It's also interesting many other countries have already and are planning to introduce similar measures, including serialization of medicines. And these would include the USA, Russia, India, China, Brazil, Argentina. And actually, here's an interesting map from GS1. GS1 is the nonprofit organization that actually defines the standards that are used in the barcodes. So if you look at the orange countries and the countries that are in turquoise blue, they're the ones where they either have live traceability or they have some sort of activity and traceability going on already. So you can see globally, this is the way things are going. It's interesting to note that the UK now has left, obviously, the FMD system. It's the Northern Ireland piece is still in there. And it's quite, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the UK now that they're effectively without any controls and falsified medicines. So people are watching very closely to see what happens. Will they start to see a rise in falsified medicines um, going in there now that um, they're no longer applying FMD? They do plan to reintroduce it. There is legislation drafted, but nothing has been done in terms of how exactly or when exactly it's going to happen. So the big question we, I get asked all the time by pharmacy colleagues is, have any falsified medicines been detected to date? Because if they haven't, well, that means the system's not working and it's a complete waste of time. So first of all, here in Ireland, so no country has been identified to date by the IMVS. So just to explain some of the jargon I use, IMVS is the Irish Medicines Verification System. So that's the Irish piece of the broader European Medicines Verification System. So the European Medicines Verification System are all the national systems, which are all connected together by a central hub that's managed by the European Medicines Verification Organization. Um, Coming back to Ireland, though, I think it's fair to say we cannot be 100% sure that there haven't been any falsified medicines because, as we know, not everyone's scanning every pack. So if you don't scan a pack, you don't know that it is or isn't fake. Um, we have seen cases of stolen packaging being used to infiltrate the illegal supply chain, and particularly things like packaging for products like Humira, very valuable. And what has happened is counterfeiters have used this the legitimate packaging and filled it with fake medicines. And what's happened is some of these have been picked up from the anti-tamper device checks. And I know certainly when the COVID vaccines came in here initially, that was one thing we had said to the National um, Cold Chain Service and also the HSC Immunisation Office, just to be careful with the 
COVID vaccine packaging because obviously it was highly valuable at that time, given that fake COVID vaccines were an issue in certain parts of the world. Falsified medicines have been identified at whole center level uh, by the Czech, Slovakian and Bulgarian national medicines verification systems. Unfortunately, we don't have a huge amount of information on what's going on. People tend to be very quiet about the detail and it's something we have raised at European level with the European Medicines Verification Organization and a number of NMBOs have that it would be really good if we could see exactly what types of cases are coming through because I think it's useful information to share back to everyone to make sure we can learn from these cases. As I've mentioned already, the European Medicines Verification System, sometimes short to EMVS, is designed primarily as a deterrent. And if we achieve this, then actually low detection rates of falsified medicines will be the norm. The analogy I would often use, it's a bit like having an alarm on your house. You have an alarm in your house as a deterrent. You don't measure the success of your alarm by the fact that it goes off all the time because you hope that the burglar will walk by and not try to break in in the first place. So that's really what this system is all about. I think it's important to take note of the amount of activity going on in the EMBS. There were 11 billion transactions in Europe last year across 29 countries. That's a lot of activity. And the consensus is that this is making Europe a very unattractive location for counterfeiters because there's simply so much scanning going on and so much checking of medicines. That it, you know, a lot of it from, you have to do a lot to get your medicines through. You have to try and get your data into the system. And, you know, it, it's not an attractive proposition from a counterfeiter's point of view anymore, one would hope. So what I want to do in the next few slides is just talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities. So we're clear who does what in relation to all of this. And there are many parties with involvement in FMT. And in fact, it's one of the few organizations and the few activities that actually touches all points in the supply chain. So every manufacturer, every wholesaler, every marketing authorization holder, every pharmacy, every hospital, Anyone who handles medicines in Europe is connected to this system. A little bit about IMBO's purpose, and I suppose the, I've taken this out of our strategy. One of the reasons I've put this up is because we often hear that IMBO is the, the FMD police. So just to put that to bed, we are not the FMD police. We are not an enforcement body. Our role is looking to our core purpose there, um, is to operate and manage the IMVS, to ensure that all alerts are investigated, and to work with EMVO, so the European organization, and other NMVOs to ensure seamless operation of the EMVS, because all our systems are interconnected, so we have to make sure they all work together. And if we change any one of the subsystems within that, we do a full round of interoperability testing to make sure that everything is seamless. So that's our core purpose. Our secondary purpose then is to enable and support, it's to provide end users, and we use the term end users to describe pharmacists, hospitals, and wholesalers that are connected to our system, and also marketing authorization holders, obviously the companies whose products data is in the system. So we enable and support them with the um, resources they require to use the IMVS and to manage alert seamlessly. So we're here to basically help you and help the manufacturers use the system and manage alert easily. The final piece, and this is the piece we're exploring, we have been exploring for about a year now, is how can we add value? So to identify ways in which IMBO and the IMVS can add value for IMBO members, IMVS users and patients. And again, I come back to the fact that we represent all the parts of the supply chain. So if you look at the IMBO board, we have a three manufacturer organizations represented. We have IPHA, Research Industry. We have Medicines for Ireland, the generic and biosimilar companies. And we have the Association of Parallel Distributors representing all the parallel importers. We have the Pharmaceutical Distributors Federation, which is Unit for Error and United Drug. And we also have the Irish Pharmacy Union. Um, we also work very closely with the HSC and with the Hospital Pharmacy Association, just for reasons in terms of Irish company law. They're not actually able to join the organization, but we work very closely with them. Um, so what we're thinking about how with all those people around the table covering this supply chain, how can we add value? So as I say, we're not an enforcement body. We are subject to supervision and enforcement by the HPRA. So at some point we will be inspected by the HPRA and we are accountable to them for what we do. Looking further then at the Department of Health, so their responsibility is for legislation and policy relating to safety features where there is scope for national decisions, and they're also accountable to the EU Commission for not any non-compliance with the EU legislation. So if there is non-compliance with any piece of European legislation. It's the relevant government department that ultimately will be called to account by the European Commission. 
We then have national competent authorities, and this is a concept you often see in European legislation, who is the national competent authority for the relevant piece of legislation. And these aim for the purposes of FMD, they supervise the system and they ensure that all parties, so that's end users, MAHs, manufacturers, and IMBO comply with their obligations. The HPRA, it looks after manufacturers, MAHs, wholesalers, and IMBO, and it also leads the follow-up if, follow, if falsified medicines are identified. So if we identify a falsified medicine, the HPRA would step in and manage the investigation from there on. The PSI is responsible for ensuring that a retail pharmacy businesses and pharmacists comply with their obligations under the legislation. And then within the HSC, they have a specific FMD project team that has looked after implementation in all the public health service locations. And they've been very active and they monitor scanning levels, they monitor alerts, um, and we work quite closely with that group. Looking then at the individual parties involved in the system, we have manufacturers and MAHs, so they obviously have to manufacture parts with 2D barcodes and anti tamper devices. They, they have to ensure that the data from those barcodes is correctly uploaded to the EMVS all the markets in which the product is marketed and they're also in, involved in the investigation of alerts in their own products. Wholesalers then, um, we often hear um, the thing, well, why can't we just let wholesalers do all the checking because they have to scan all the medicines. They don't actually have to scan the medicines. In fact, they only are only required to scan a relatively small proportion of medicines that go through the warehouses, specifically returns from customers. Um, and also packs that they get from any source other than the manufacturer, the market authorization holder, or their designated wholesaler. So that means if it's coming directly from the manufacturer, MAH, or their contract storage site, they don't have to scan them when they receive them, otherwise they do. And most medicines, particularly the quintus big wholesalers, would not have to be scanned. Now, Unifarm United Drug actually voluntarily do sample scanning that goes inwards of a sample number from each batch that they get in. And that's really useful in terms of making sure that the data has been uploaded and it prevents huge numbers of alerts further on down the line when medicines get to pharmacies and hospitals. So that's really valuable, that voluntary action that they take. They also decommission packs as destroyed, stolen, locked, that locked means quarantines as appropriate. They also decommission um, packs as applied that are going to Article 23 locations. So Article 23 is actually a reference to the delegated regulation. And basically, um, these are locations that are defined in EU and national laws being exempt from the requirement to do loan decommissions. For example, GPs, prisons, vets, there's a big long list there. And finally, then wholesalers obviously have to investigate alerts generated in the loan warehouses. Pharmacies and hospitals. So the requirement is that pharmacists must authenticate packs provided prior to supply by patients by scanning the 2D barcode and checking the anti tampering device. So you have to make sure that the data in the barcode is okay, that it scans okay, and you also have to make sure that the anti tampering device is intact. Now, again, when this has to be done, is set out in the European Delegated Regulation, and community pharmacies have to scan the pack at the time of supplying it to the public. Hospitals have a little bit more flexibility in that they can scan the pack at any time after it arrives in the hospital. And in the hospital, it can come into typically hospitals of three locations that receive packs. They have pharmacy, they have stores, a lot of the fluids go to stores, and then the lab tends to receive the, the blood products that are licensed as medicines. The reason why hospitals have been given this flexibility is because if you were to say that they have to scan at the time of supplying it to the public. Every single ward, every single you know, um, outpatient clinic, anywhere medicine has been handed over to patients would potentially have to have a, a decommissioning point there. So that was some flexibility that was introduced in the, in the law. Um, in both hospitals and pharmacies, if the scan generates an alert, follow-up action is required. So you have to do something about it. You have to start investigating because only uh, you, we can do a certain amount of work, the manufacturer can do a certain amount, but actually... The pharmacy the hospital has access to information that we just simply don't have. Um, and the pack must be withheld from supply until falsification is ruled out. So you're actually breaking the law if you hand out a pack without having confirmation from someone or having worked out yourself that the pack has not been falsified. Um, if the pack appears to have been tampered with, and this is HP Ray advice, you don't supply the pack and you report your concern to the HP Ray's suspected quality defect via the HP Ray's online reporting system. Now, you don't have to report alerts to the HPRA because they get all the alerts automatically that are generated in the system and they don't look at them all, but they certainly get them. The only ones the HPRA are really interested in in terms of alerts are the ones that actually turn out to be falsified. So they expect 
pharmacies, wholesalers, hospitals, manufacturers working with IMBO to do the investigation and only to bring the HPRA in if we've established that something pretty much looks like it's falsified medicine. So where are we now? Um, so looking at progress since the end of use in May last year, the weekly end user alert rates have fallen to about 0.05%. So that's one alert to nearly 20,000 transactions. And to be fair, this is largely due to there's been huge work done by end users, by pharmacies, hospitals and wholesalers to sort out scanners, to get the software working properly, you know, to stop WD commission constantly scanning the same packs, whether inadvertently or just being careful. That has really, most of the avoidable alerts are gone. The same with the manufacturers, they're now very thorough in terms of getting their data uploaded. As I mentioned, the fact that the wholesalers check the packs on the way in, the big wholesalers, that's really made sure that if there's any batch related data problems are picked up very early and fixed long before they ever get the, the packs ever go out into um, pharmacies and hospitals. Scanning and decommissioning rates have improved. I'll show you still more to go there. And that's something that the PSI is responsible for, increasing the scanning levels. And I know they're, they're very active in that space and we have to give them reports to support their activities. So they look to us um, to generate those reports. Pharmacy and hospital engagement with IMPO has increased significantly and we've been very pleased with the number of people who contact us and the number of people who come back to us with their queries. Um, you know, so that's something that we're very pleased with that. NMVS alerts is our alert management system. I'll come back to that later on, but the, definitely the usage of that by pharmacies and hospitals is steadily increasing and I'll you know, explain to you later why that's important. From an IMBO perspective, what we've done is we've been continuously communicating to hospitals and pharmacies on the most common issues that we see over the last year in order to prevent further alerts. So if we're writing to you about something, it's because we're seeing lots of alerts or lots of examples of that. And it's really to try and say, look, if you look out for these things and don't do this, you won't get alerts. And then finally, in relation to the EMVS, the whole European system and the Irish part specifically, there has been continuous improvement of that system. So we do two big releases a year and if you if there's fix that needed in between, but they're actually reducing because the system has been very stable. We have very rarely got outages or problems with the system. So that's a huge relief to us that we, you know, a lot of work has gone into really improving the system enhancing the user experience, eliminating system-related alerts, and we really feel that the system is very stable and it's working very well, which is, is very positive. Okay, so we look at the alerts. We look at the alert rate from January to May this year. You can see there's been a steady decline. We were running about 0 0.05 at the start of the year. We're now consistently just under 0 0.05, and it's been st steadily going down. We see an odd spike like this, but that could be something like we had a case a couple of weeks ago where one wholesaler had to decommission 50,000 packs. They were putting them into quarantine. And the operative who was doing it, she managed to actually scan a thousand of them twice. So that caused a thousand alerts. But look, that can happen when you're you're doing 50,000 packs, you know, and nobody gets very excited about that because we know what the issue is. It just has happened. But by and large, we're on a downward trajectory on the alert rate, which is very positive. And again, that goes back to the fact people are simply have got the avoidable stuff under control. I suppose one thing is uh, people often ask, well, how often do pharmacies get alerts? So we, we work out every month percentile. So basically 50% of pharmacies in May got no alerts and 90% of them got four or less. So most people get very few alerts. Um, and when we tend to see if we have a thousand alerts a week, you could find 200 of them in one site where something has just happened. The scanner has stopped working or software starts doing something funny. And suddenly you can get a whole raft of alerts, but we don't tend to get lots of alerts across lots of pharmacies, which is very positive. So what are the most common causes of alerts at the moment? Actually, at the moment, exempt medicine, and practice and licensed medicine cause us a lot of problems. And that's why we are constantly communicating about those, because what happens is, um, um, I, I should put the Brexit point before that, a lot of the packs coming in from the UK in particular, it's no longer mandatory to upload data to the UK system. So the problem is these packs look like FMD packs. They have a barcode on them. They have an anti-tamper device, but the data has been uploaded to the UK system. So we, what we try and do there is convince the manufacturer in the UK to upload the data to the UK system, even though it's to facilitate unlicensed medicines being sold in the Irish market. Most of them are very helpful with that. Um, the other big thing we see a huge number of alerts with at the moment is, and it, it's one of the biggest problems we have, when people borrow packs, we find they're frequently 
decommissioned in the lending location. And then they go to the second pharmacy and then they're decommissioned again and we get another alert. We sometimes see where packs are borrowed from hospitals because hospitals decommissioned goods inwards. You often see those packs um, uh, will scan as um, they generate an alert when they're scanned in the second pharmacy because they're already decommissioned. So when we look at the patterns of borrowing, we can see borrowing between pharmacies beside each other, and we can also see borrowing between pharmacies in a group. So it's just something to watch out for. We have some advice on that, which I'll come to later on. We're going to be sending out some reference cards about this because this is causing 50, 60, 70 alerts every week. As I said, we've mentioned the Brexit effect. And um, so we've perhaps coming in as unlicensed medicines, or sometimes you may be aware that the HPRA will allow UK PACs, they sort of grant them a temporary Irish authorization under what's called a batch specific request or a BSR. And um, in that situation, where the data has been uploaded, we do get alerts with them. Um, alerts due to wholesaler errors. So there's um, the wholesalers provide a paid service to the hospitals where they do the scanning for them. Um, and the data is then transmitted and decommissioned in the hospital when the goods come in. So sometimes if what's sent to the hospital physically doesn't match what's in the barcode, then we have problems. But I say that's something for the HSC sites and the wholesalers to sort out between them. Also repeated scanning, I've already given an example of that. We see some MAH procedure of errors and we see things like delays in data upload. We see some practical stuff. It's not actually an error, but it's just simply a process point. It's where, say, packs arrive into the country before batch release. So they put into quarantine and wholesale, but the data hasn't been uploaded yet to the EMBS. The scan that goes in was in the wholesale where they will generate alerts because they're just waiting to complete the batch release. So that's something that, you know, the HPRA has asked manufacturers to make sure if they're sending packs to wholesalers that haven't had data uploaded yet, that they make sure they're aware of that when they send the packs. Um, and there's more information about the common cause of alerts in the backup slides if you want to have a look at those later on. We did an analysis of the root causes of alerts. I mean, most of the time we have hard information. Sometimes we're making, because we haven't had any feedback from a pharmacy or hospital about an alert, sometimes we don't have actual confirmation of our assessment of what we think the issue is. But we, we look at this analysis every week. And the reason we look at it is, is it allows us to identify, is there anything particular we might keep an eye on. So for example, if you look at software and scanner there, um, you see software alerts 52, 42, 61. If that suddenly jumped to 100, we'd have a look and see is there one particular pharmacy that's causing that, should we be looking into them? The scanner numbers of alerts are really good. So the scanners are not causing problems anymore. Um, you can see the number of repeated decommissions at the same location. That's now quite low, 69 and week 21. That would have been four, five, six hundred a year ago. So people have stopped a lot of that. Um, the ones that are in the dark green or the green shading in the bottom half of the graph, they're the ones that don't impact at all at end user level, at pharmacy or hospital level. So say, for example, the MAH transactions, there's 261 alerts, they're only 21. They have no impact whatsoever at pharmacy level. You can actually see it's unlicensed medicines actually cause a lot of problems. So that's one of the reasons why we have issued advice with the HPRA on how to handle unlicensed medicines. So in a good week, we have maybe 600 alerts. Last week was, or that week of the 22nd of May was um, 1,250. We know there's, um, this week, I think we've got two and a half thousand. This was one MAH did something and generated a lot of alerts, but again, nothing that's been seen at pharmacy or hospital level. So um, this is the level of analysis that we do in IMBO. We have two people working in our operations team and as well as um, dealing with calls from pharmacies about alerts and manufacturers, they analyze, they look at every single alert to see what's going on. And, and sometimes they're able to get assess what the root cause is. Sometimes we do need feedback from yourselves. So that's why you will hear from us and we'll explain that in a moment. Scanning activity has been going up steadily. So we're averaging about 1.7 um, million scans per week. So say um, sometimes it goes up and down. We tend to find the start of the month and the end of the month tend to be higher. This dip was Christmas, the 0.9 million. This goes back to January 22, this 1.05 million dip in early 2022. That was actually the, the week of the two bank holidays in, in St. Patrick's week last year. Um, the decommissioning rate, so this is the number of packs successfully decommissioned at suspense per week. So this should be close to 100, or, you know, certainly average out over the year, close to 100. You can see it's running kind of between 
it's around about 65, 66, 67 percent. So we do know, and the PSI is aware that not all packs have been scanned, and this is something that they are required to follow up on um, to make sure, because it is a requirement under the European legislation to actually scan packs and decommission it. It's a legal requirement, so that's why they, that's their role there to enforce that. So a little bit about alert management. I'm just going to talk through just the process of it and then just some things to look out for. So just before I start, and this is a slightly busy slide, but I'll fly through it. It's really just explaining to you the responses that you get on screen when you scan. So when you verify or decommission a pack, your software displays a response which contains text and is color-coded green and red, depending on the outcome of the scan. So that's something we've asked the software providers to do because we think it's useful in terms, particularly the color coding, um, telling you what to do. So the amber and red responses indicate something isn't quite right. So something is not matching between the information from the scan and what is in the IMVS, but that there's some sort of a problem with the scan itself. So the scan might not get submitted to the IMVS. Now, not all of those messages that you get in red or amber responses are alerts. A certain proportion of them are alerts, and these are potential falsifications. These are the ones that have to be looked into. So the ones which represent um, potential falsifications, i.e. are alerts, these can be recognized as following. The message that you get from the screen will include the words an alert has been raised. If you can look into it further, and it depends on your software, you will see a unique alert ID. So the, when they're sent to us, we get this unique alert ID. You will receive an email from our alert management system for NBS alerts for these alerts. So shortly after these alerts, you will get an automated email from us with the link to NMBS alerts and with a link to the kind of page for that alert. All these alerts are automatically notified to ourselves, to the MAH for the product and to the HPRA, as I mentioned earlier. And these alerts have to be investigated and falsification ruled out before the pack can be supplied as per the requirements of the European law. And all of those scan responses are known as exceptions. So how would you know what the issue is? So you've got something that's green. How do you know what you're supposed to do next? Because this is the question we get asked all the time. So first of all, the message on the screen will give you a high level summary of what has happened. So it might say an alert has been generated, pack has already been decommissioned. Again, it really depends on how the software has been configured. But importantly, it will include a link to a help page in the IPO website. And this is something, again, the wholesalers, uh, the software providers have done at our request. It'll link through to our website. And if you click it, that link, it will bring you to a bespoke page that will assist you in identifying the root cause for that particular alert or exception. So there's different help pages for different types of alerts. Um, it also provides guidance on how to fix it if you've got a scan or a software issue. So all that would be available if you click on that link. And we do look at the click through rates on those pages and we do see consistent usage of those pages, which is, is good to see. As I've mentioned, um, for alerts, you will also get an email from our NMBS alerts. And anything we know about the um, alert or if the MAH knows about an alert will be available there. So to give you an example, we know at the moment, and I'll mention at the moment, eutrogestin unlicensed medicines sometimes generate alerts because they're already decommissioned when they arrive in Ireland. As soon as we see any of those alerts and those products, we actually mark them as closed. So when you go in and look there, you'll see that alert is closed. I don't need to worry anymore about it. It's done and dusted. It's fine. The same as the MAH, if they, for example, needed to upload data, because there was alerts because they hadn't uploaded the data for a batch. As soon as they've uploaded that data, they can close all the alerts. And you can see it's sorted and the data is there. I can go ahead. The other thing is we monitor the system continuously for large numbers of alerts, unusual patterns of alerts by product. And we look at it by batch or by end user location. And we will contact yourself or the MAH or the FMD software provider. So if we see lots of alerts across different locations all using the same FMD software provider, we'll actually just go directly to the software provider because that looks like a software issue. And really is to advise on how to prevent further alerts. So we have two people in the team who are constantly looking at these alerts. They do a huge amount of analysis and machine um, they're doing some sort of, I'm not into this stuff, but there's two of my guys are really into data analytics. One of them is a PhD in maths, and they're constantly looking at patterns and machine learning and looking to see what are the root causes of the alerts that are generated. So just to give you some examples of alerts, so these are the potential falsifications. So I'll just talk through the first two, say there. So batch not found. Now, there's the likely root causes for this, it can either be a scanner or a software issue. You might say, well, why would it be a scanner or a software issue? It could be that the scanner or the software are not reading the data correctly. 
It could also be that the data has not been uploaded by the MAH, but ironically, it's less likely to be that than the scanner or software issue. Um, the same with pack not found or serial number is unknown. Again, that is more likely to be a scan or software issue than the data not uploaded. So what do you do next? You follow the advice on the help page linked from your FMD software provider because it'll give you the right advice for that type of alert. If you identify a root cause in the pharmacy, so if you identify, for example, oops, my scanner was in caps lock, that's what caused the alerts, you let us know. And I'll talk to you in a moment about how you do that. If you can't identify root cause, you set the pack aside until you're informed of the outcome of the MAH's investigation, because in addition to you looking at that alert, they're also looking at it. Um, you keep the pack in the pharmacy or hospital until the MAH or the HPA advises you what to do next with it, and you do not supply it to a patient. And if you need any help with any of this, just give us a ring or send us an email and we so see what we can do to help you. Examples of exceptions. So these are um, something has happened. It's not a full blown alert. So we're not looking here at a potential falsification. So the, the most common one is actually product code not unknown. And this is because it means that there is a barcode. It's been scanned. The system doesn't recognize the product at all. And typically it's because it's a non-FMD pack. So it's something like a medical device. As you know, a lot of medical devices now have 2D barcodes. It could be an OTC. It could be an unlicensed medicine from outside the EU. So we know, for example, in the early days of COVID vaccines, the first COVID vaccines that came in were US packs or Swiss packs, and they had 2D barcodes on them. The other one you might get is you might get a message the batch has been recalled. So if the pack has been recalled, then you just need to go back in your records and just double check that and you need to return those packs um, to the wholesaler per the standard recall notification. The next one you might get here is the pack cannot be reactivated. So this is where you decommissioned it and, for example, for a patient who didn't pick it up and you want to reactivate it, there's a time limit on that. You can only do it within 10 days and that time limit is defined in law and the system is programmed to not allow you to dispense it after 10 or three revert it or reactivate it after 10 days. So what do you do if you get any of these? You follow the advice in the help page. Again, click through from your software and you contact us if you need any further assistance. Now, you won't receive any NMBS alerts about these exceptions because they're not alerts and you don't need to notify IMVO. You don't need to send us any information about these at the moment. That could change down the road, but for now, there's no expectation that you have to inform anyone about these. Okay, a little bit about the IMBO alert management guidance. So obviously one of the things we realised, and it was this was in all countries, that we needed some national guidance on what is the process for managing alerts. And here in Ireland, we have this, it's called IMBO alert management guidance, but actually it was drawn up following consultation with stakeholders, so pharmacies, hospitals, wholesalers, manufacturers, HPRA and PSI. And this sets out the high level process for everyone. A key principle underpinning this guidance that alert does not mean that a pack is definitely falsified. Because I've heard this said, well, if you're getting 1,000 alerts a week, that means 10,000 or 1,000 packs that can't be supplied to patients must be sent back to the wholesaler. Not correct. It, the alert means something is not matching, but there could be a perfectly legitimate um, reason for that. And most times, like, the, it would be so rare we would find a falsified medicine. Um, because alerts can arise due to technical procedural or system issues. So the objective of this guidance is to ensure alerts are quickly investigated and closed out of root causes found, enabling the pack to be supplied and returned to saleable stock as soon as possible. Very importantly, pharmacists are empowered to supply the pack if they know the root causes on their site. So if you know, for example, you've double decommissioned that pack or you scanned it with your scanner with the cap locks on, you turn off the scanner, you, you do a verification scan, that's fine. You can go ahead and supply that pack. You don't need any feedback from ourselves or from the MAH or from the HPRA or anyone else. So that's an important point. Next steps. Now, what happens is, given that the, um, the expectation is that end users, pharmacies, hospitals and wholesalers and MAHs are expected to try and find out what's caused this alert and to let the other parties know, and I'll talk about the communications shortly. If we've heard nothing at all after two working days, the guidance provides that we step in and we basically ask for the alert to be investigated if not already done, or if something has been done, we gather the information. You So what will happen is you will get a reminder email from NMBS alerts two working days after the alert is generated. So you'll get an email the day it's generated. You'll get one two working days later. And if there's no feedback, after you get another one after another four working days. The guidance also provides um, that if 
we cannot close out alerts. So our job is to make sure that all alerts are investigated. If we're unable to do that because either an end user or an MAH doesn't give us any assistance or they don't give us the information we require, that should actually be IMVO, not EMVO, to enable the investigation to be completed, we're required to escalate this to the PSI or HPRA as appropriate. Now, the PSI, we're, in, we're still waiting to see what they plan to do with this. HPRA certainly will intervene very quickly with manufacturers and MEHs if they're not satisfied that they're dealing with the alerts fast enough. In fact, they have um, threatened inspections, um, which from anyone who works in the farm industry will know a HPRA inspection is quite a, a big deal, particularly for causal. So um, they will step in very quickly if they believe that the MEH is not taking their responsibilities seriously. So in terms of communication during the alert investigation, because of different people looking at different aspects of this, we need some way of talking to each other about this. So particularly if, say, an end user finds a root cause, if you identify why the alert was caused in the pharmacy, you know exactly what happened. The MAH and her says, we need to be made aware of this so we can stop looking. If you can't find anything on your site, then obviously you need to know what the MAH has come up with and the pack is genuine before you spy. So again, there needs to be some way of getting that information to you. If neither the pharmacy nor the MAH can find any obvious root cause, at that point, the MAH might want to get a photo of the pack. They might want to get a photo of the barcode um, because that sometimes helps them dig into the batch records further, do a little bit more investigation. And if they're still not sure what's going on, they may actually ask for the pack to be returned for examination. So we need some way of getting this message from one party to another. Um, just to be clear, returning the pack for examination, that is extremely rare. That's in, like, you're probably really looking at a potential, you know, a, a really likely falsification if you get to the point where you're looking for the pack to be sent back. Very unusual that that would happen. I can't remember a single case since we first um, started running this in 2019. So in terms of how the communications will take place, NMBS alerts is the alert management system we are using. It's basically an online tool. It's available 24-7. And for every alert, it has a page that shows the information that's been inputted by the end user, or the alert who scanned the pack, the MAH, and by IMBO. So if we've got any information at all, we can put it in there, and the other parties can see that information. This is the preferred, a preferred communication tool, and in fact, the guidance strongly recommends it. I know the HPRA in particular is particularly enthusiastic about NMBS alerts. We've also found that wholesalers, when we ran a pilot on this last year, and we, we let them access it for a while, and then we closed it, they actually came back and said, no, actually, do you mind leaving it open? Because we use it as our a repository to document what we've done about these alerts. We do the same in IMVO. So NMVS alerts is where we record all our actions about each individual alert. So we use it as a document repository system or an information repository system about our alert handling activities. So we find it very useful for that. And I think as pharmacies, you know, it is something that if you've decided, for example, to hand out a pack, you've made a decision yourself that you've found a root cause, I think it would be prudent to have that documented in NMVS alerts should you be asked at a later stage. Um, about this. We know in Sweden, the pharmacy NCA there, they're now going into pharmacies and asking them to show the evidence to back up their decision to supply packs that generate alerts. So something we haven't seen that here yet, but certainly we know it's happening in other countries. If you opt not to use NMBS alerts, and it is voluntary, um, we'd have to communicate by phone or email. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's slower, um, and, it will, and particularly from an MAH point of view, there's a rule, and it comes from European organisations, not from ourselves, that the, the manufacturer of the MAH is not allowed to know who the pharmacy is. If they want to talk to a pharmacy by email, they have to email us and we have to email you, and your response comes back, doesn't go south, so it's quite inefficient. So again, if people could use NMBS alerts, it would be in, make life easier for everyone. In terms of using NMBS alerts, you have two options. You can set up an account which allows you to log in to see all your alerts and, and obviously you can report any information you want. And the type of message we see is things like our scanner wasn't working, we accidentally decommissioned the pack seven times, so that's perfect. And I've given you the email address there if you want to set up an account. I think we have about 280 pharmacies have set up accounts. Not a huge amount, but it's about 10%. So it's, it's in, you know, and we represent a number of the groups. So there will be more than 280 pharmacies using NBS alerts. You can also access it via the email link that I mentioned. So I've mentioned to you, get emails about your alerts and they'll come from NMBS alerts and um, there will be a link in there and you can just 
click into that link. It's a one-time link, add in whatever information you can, and you can use it to send information about the alert, send photos. The same, if you're logged into the system, you can also send photos to the manufacturers if they, if they ask for them. Okay, I just want to mention very briefly um, HPRA guidance on scanning unlicensed medicines, the IMVO HPRA guidance, because we've seen so many alerts with unlicensed medicines. And the reason is, as I said, primarily UK PACS data not uploaded. The other biggie that we've seen, we've seen tens of thousands of alerts with these, is eutrogestin PACS coming in. I think they're French PACS. Unfortunately, a lot of these packs were actually exported out of the European Union to Switzerland. They were decommissioned as exported. They were brought back into Ireland as unlicensed medicines. They're already decommissioned as exported. And if you scan them, they will generate an alert. So the advice we came up with was, um, having discussed it at length with the HPR and PSI was consulting, we would have talked to Claire Fitzell and the IPU about this. If you know a pack is an unlicensed medicine, don't scan it as the IMVS may not recognize the pack. So that's really the easiest thing. Don't scan unlicensed medicines. If you do happen to scan it and get an alert, you may supply the pack unless you either have overriding concerns that a falsified medicine involved. You see, you think there's something odd about the pack or you think it looks like it's been interfered with. Or if the scan comes back that the pack is expired, recalled, withdrawn, stolen, or destroyed, you should not supply the pack. Always check the anti-tampering device if there is one. And again, just if you find any problems with that, make sure you report it to the HPRA and don't supply the pack. I've just added a little note there at the bottom because one of the things, if you scan an unlicensed medicine, even if it scans correctly, which a lot of them do, because if you say scan packs that come in, say from France or any country, Germany, if the data is in the German or the French system, it, they'll actually scan fine because the system will find them. Um, but the one thing you will not see the product name on screen, and that's just because we don't have those product names in the Irish system, which returns the product name. So that's why they will be blank if you do happen to scan them. So the overriding advice with um, unlicensed medicine is don't scan them. OK, just I put on this very quickly some current known issues that are causing problems. I've mentioned the eutrogestin. They accounted for 44 percent of alerts and pharmacies last week. We've got Saxenda, um, it has been approved for supply without PAC data uploaded to the EMBS. So again, um, just watch out for those. Ideally, don't scan them because there's no data in them. And I think there's a letter, a caution and newsletter that's banded to the PAC saying that. In Sarazet, um, we've been made aware that the 1D barcode is very close to the 2D barcode and the scanner is picking up both. So that's creating jumbled data and they're scanning with alerts. We've made the manufacturer aware of that, but in the meantime, you know, they need to sort that out and change their packaging. But in the meantime, if you cover the one with the barcode, you just found that and sort it out. Vaccines, just make sure if you're looking at vaccines coming in from the national cold chain in service, if they have been decommissioned, they'll have a sticker on them. Don't scan those again because they will cause alerts. Okay, so miscellaneous, just um, sort of things that we're working on behind the scenes. Brexit has been a big problem from an FMD perspective because of the UK data now not being mandatory to upload. And we've worked really closely with the HPRA, MVO, and the NMVOs and the other markets heavily reliant on UK packs, so that would be more than Cyprus, to find technical and procedural solutions to minimise alerts with packs sourced from the UK post-Brexit. And we, we're also looking at the broader implications of Brexit and the broader supply chain impacts, and particularly the new Windsor framework. There's a lot of analysis going on at the moment to understand what that will do. And we're doing whatever we can to support the DOH and the HPRA and their efforts to minimize this broader supply chain impact, because we're very mindful of the fact of the shortages that are around. The board is also considering how we can add value beyond FMD compliance. So you have to do that scan anyway for FMD compliance, but could you get more value from it? Could you, you know? track adherence and patience within your pharmacy system? Could you um, improve your expiry date management? Like, there's lots of possibilities. Again, being mindful when we're looking at potential added value of the challenges that are out there, such as medicine shortages. And also we're aware that there's an expedited move to healthcare system digitalization post-COVID. So is there something there that has some possibilities with that barcode scan? So support available for my view. I'm just going to fly through this because I'm conscious it's eight minutes to nine. So just very briefly meet the team and um, because who are the people behind so myself? Obviously, I'm a pharmacist. We have an operations manager, we have an IT manager, we have a quality manager. The reason we have a quality manager is we're required to operate a GMP manufacturing level quality system. It's an extremely rigorous quality system. So we need someone working all the time on that. 
We have Sarah, who's our admin and communications executive. Any of you who's contacted us about registration connection queries, it would be Sarah you talked to. She's uh, really good on, uh, with this. She's worked in the pharmacy herself. She was a former assistant pharmacy manager, so she really understands what it's like to be in the pharmacy. And we have two uh, guys then, Paul and Guilherme, who are our operations executives, and they deal with all the alert analysis, scanning and alert queries. So again, if you get a call about alerts, it'll be one of them and we make them to you. So we have a service desk available um, where we are open um, until 8 o'clock every evening, 9 to 6 on Saturdays and 11 to 6 Sundays and public holidays. Um, if you want to contact us about alerts using NMBS alerts, you can email us or call the service desk. One thing I would say is if you're having a problem with your FMD software, it's better you go to your software provider first. Generally, they'll be better able to fix the problem than we will. So try them first before you come to us. If you're having problems with them, do come to us. We, we do intervene sometimes if we feel there isn't enough speed on the side of the FMD software provider. We have a website, various pieces there. We also have um, the live IMVS status is available as the link that's given there. Um, we have recently developed some reference cards for dispensing teams based on the most common avoidable alerts we see in pharmacies, and they're going to be posted out shortly to pharmacies and hospitals. Um, and this is what they look like. So what products are out of scope? Um, don't decommission a pack is destroyed if it's already um, expired, because if you do that, um, you'll get alerts or exceptions. So there's a few pointers there. And again, please use these and talk to, make sure your teams are aware of these. Um, there's a little bit there about lending and borrowing because I say we see quite a few alerts related to packs that have been decommissioned in already in the lending location and causing the alerts in the second location. We also offer a bespoke support session. So a Paul and Guilherme will run sessions by phone, Zoom or Teams for you and your teams. They can do whatever you want. Like they deal with scanning queries, scanner configuration, IMVS account queries, alert queries. So just email us with your name, phone number and what you need and we'll pick and we'll organise a slot and we can do them at eight o'clock in the morning, we can do them at six o'clock in the evening, very flexible about that. And that's just some more information, we're on LinkedIn and Twitter and PSIH Puree and there's also the Commission have a Q&A and safety features which is on the website and that's basically it. So I will stop sharing and we'll see then have we got any questions. Hi, Leonie. I think we just have one question that came in there. I think you can see it. Emer put it in. Um, and basically, it seemed to have been an issue with the 2D barcode. Um, it appears to have had a built-in error. And um, so when scanned, um, a different trade name comes up. Okay. What's happened there is the 2D barcode is obviously fine because there's actually only four data elements in the barcode. There's uh, product code, there's a batch number, an expiry date and a serial number. That's all that's in the barcode. But when that is scanned, what happens is the FMD software links it to a database that has all what we call the product master data with things like the name, the form, the strength. So actually, if you see that problem, the error is actually in the product master data. So it's a data entry error by the manufacturer. So if you see those, just pop us a quick email and we bring it to the attention of the manufacturer because it's actually relatively easy to fix that. So anything you see like that, just send us an email and we pass that on to the manufacturer. It's the same if people tell us, you know, the 1D barcode is too close to the 2D and we're constantly managing to scan, but we will always feed that back to the manufacturer to try and prevent that problem. So that's what's going on there. The barcode is fine. It's actually, the, it's the master data that's been, that's picked up and the scan is done. Okay. Any more questions? Here we go, Amanda has put one in. If you accidentally scan an expired product, are you then meant to scan it as destroyed? No, I think that's fine. You don't need to do anything further with it. If it's expired, it's expired. So I wouldn't worry about that one. Um, if it generates, and I think it only generates an exception rather than an alert, but if it did happen to generate an alert, just pop a message into NMBS alerts and just say accidentally scanned it. That's all you need to do. And then that's the end of it. But, you know, it's fine. The system is automatically set to expire the medicines once, once they reach their expiry date. They're all automatically marked as expired. Anybody else got any more questions? 
I thought, um, Leona, your thing on added value is very interesting that you've obviously, the, the, it, it's refined down enough that you can start to, to look at the benefits. I know yeah. Brexit will yeah. keep you busy, but... <laughs> When we joke about Brexit as a gift that keeps on giving, just when you think it's settled, and actually we had really thought it was settled by the end of last year and then the Windsor Framework got produced. And where the Windsor Framework is potentially going to cause problems is the Northern Ireland system that's connected now to the European system because they still comply with European law. It's going to be disconnected. So there's going to be no possibility to upload the UK PAC data anymore. So there's a lot of discussions. We've had a lot of meetings with colleagues in Brussels to try and see what can we do to prevent, because as we keep saying, Walker we can't out. have more noise, and particularly at a time when there are so many unlicensed medicines because of the shortages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the potentially bigger issue is the Northern Windsor framework potentially rules out any UK medicines coming into the EU. That's what it says. So you might have no FMD problems, but you might have a much bigger problem called no medicines. Yeah, supply. So that's, yeah, what's, yeah. that's what's written in it. Like, we were all just gobsmacked when we saw that. It's the only country in the world that they're specifically saying the medicines must not come into the EU. And did, so are there businesses said, aware of that? That's what I'd be wondering. Oh, yeah. No, every, I think manufacturers are all aware of it. I think everyone's just looking at it thinking, goodness. And it was a political agreement that was agreed by politicians without any recourse to... Anyone who might know anything about the practical realities of medicine supply in Europe. Um, but um, yeah, your added value um, is that, that that's kind of will evolve over I think time. That's right. I think my own sense is I think in 10 years' time, what you will see, and it will take time to get, I think what you'll see is you'll see the PAC scan, you'll see the PAC details entered into the patient's record, you'll see some sort of software sure. on the pharmacy computer that'll be monitoring how often is that patient coming back to get those medicines that will possibly be generating. You might even see, like we see at the moment with haemophilia products in Ireland, when the haemophilia patients, they scan their packs when they get them. And that's recorded by the National Haemophilia Service. Yeah, so in terms of your batch numbers and all that, you're seeing Yeah, all of yeah. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can actually mm -hmm. see as the patient taking the medicine. You might even see, there's some discussion now about putting barcodes down to individual dose levels. So you might even see bedside administration being recorded, you record the barcode on the patient's bracelet, you record the barcode of, say, the nurses administered yes, the medicine, yes. you record the barcode. Like, these products, these are already going on for medical devices, they're already going on for foods in many Irish hospitals. And it's, I think it's very simple to see that a lot of this type of usage of barcodes yeah, will say, extend. The process that are in place. Um, and with that, that would aid in recalls as well, wouldn't it? Um, Everything, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the problem with recalls at the moment is the system is designed to cover recalls to, um, to pharmacy levels. The problem in Ireland is because of our supply problems, you often have recalls to wholesale level, but not to pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, um, it's all a bit, um, um, you know, on, it's a bit messy. I'm just looking here. I see a query about why do we still have shortages. I'm afraid that's not in our remit <laughs> at all. I would refer you to Darren Scully from the HPRA who was here a few weeks ago, and Darren could come and talk about that. I um, think that, I was going to no. say I think there's a webinar up. If you look on the IOP website, you might yeah, find a recorded you webinar that uh, could could guide yeah, you definitely. on that one. Darren and I have done many sessions back to back and we seem to get invited a lot to the same meetings to do back to back. And so, you know, I have no idea why the shortages. I think you could write many PhD theses on the subjects of why there are medicine shortages in Ireland. But anyway, um, so I suppose just one general observation for me before we wrap up. I think our sense is things have really settled on the FMD front over the last 12 months. I know there was a lot of angst in about it and people worried about it as being headed into the end of years now. And I have to say ourselves, we were quite apprehensive about what was going to happen. The reality is once you settle into this, once you get used to scanning and you get used to, this is why we're seeing the avoidable alerts are going away because people are just, they've worked out how to make sure they don't happen. Like the best way to manage alerts is actually prevent them. Don't let them happen in the first place. And what we see is people are getting very few alerts. And when they do, you know, they seem to be able to handle them and they're contacting us and we're able to give them advice. So that would be my big ask of you. If you're not sure what to do, just lift the phone, send us an email and we'll get you sorted out. Right, Leone, great to see that the journey is, um, I suppose, the bumps have been ironed out. It's been a bit bumpy, but we're getting there, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. the graphs are smoothing out, going up and smoothing out, um, all in the right direction, so that's great. 
Um, I'm just going to prompt everybody. Audrey has put up a link, um, a, a survey link, just to say uh, if you want to give feedback on this um, session. But uh, I would have to say it was a really um, informative session by Leonie. I saw 62 slides and I thought, oh my God. But actually it flew um, and all really useful information. Um, so thank you to her. And I know that, um, again, if people want to, if they're feeling very lively, um, you can do something in your ear portfolio and maybe start a reflection and document some learning and action in that. Um, Audrey has that slide up. Um, and I know that this will be available on the website in uh, the recorded webinar section, certainly in the next few days. Um, so if anybody doesn't see it or wants to go back and follow up or even chase up some of the addresses that Leonie put up, or the links, um, uh, they'll be there. Um, and just to flag, our next webinar, we're, we're keeping going all through the summer. Um, the next one is this day, two weeks, the 21st of June, the longest day of the year. And so we have Katrina Bradley, who is the executive director of the IOP, along with Dr. Mary Collins, um, who's a chartered psychologist and has done um, webinars before, excellent webinars before with the IOP. And the title of the next one is Positive Psychology. So again, emails out via, um, invite out via email and just as I said, keep an eye on social media for that. Um, and I'll end by saying thank you very much to everybody for coming and thank you for Audrey for the backup and Leonie for a really informed um, uh, session. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Leonie. Thanks, Jade. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.